ओम नम शिवाय हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम बैक टू आर ई टीचिंग चैनल आई हैव अ काइंड रिक्वेस्ट टू ऑल आर व्यूवर्स वी हैव अ न्यू ऑप्शन ऑफ मेंबरशिप फॉर आर ई टीचिंग चैनल यू कैन डोनेट टू आर चैनल बाय जॉइनिंग एज अ मेंबर दिस वुड फर्दर एनकरेज अस टू पोस्ट एजुकेशनल वीडियोस एंड ऑडियो बुक्स थैंक यू and now please do subscribe to our channel to listen to various chapters of immortals of meluha the part 1 of shiva trilogy 2 today we will listen to chapter 14 and before that as usual a quick recap of chapter 13 blessings of the impure so we saw in that chapter shiva comes to know the reason behind why sati became a vikarma lady and at the end of the chapter we saw shiva visiting lord mohan temple in mohanjodaro so now let's proceed with chapter 14 pandit of mohanjodaro shiva opened his eyes to behold a man who was almost replica of the pandit he had met at the brahma temple in what seemed like another life he sported a similar long flowing white beard and a big white mane he wore a saffron dhoti and angavastram the wizened face bore a calm and welcoming smile if it was not for this pandit's much taller frame shiva could have easily mistaken him for the one he had met at the brahma temple how are you my friend repeated the pandit sitting down I'm all right Pandit ji said Shiva using the Indian term ji as a form of respect he could not follow why but the intrusion was welcome to him it almost seemed as though he was drawn to this temple because he was destined to meet the pandit do all pandits in meluha look alike the man smiled warmly not all the pandits just us and who might us be pandit ji the next time you meet one of us we will tell you said the pandit cryptically that is a promise why not now at this point of time our identity is not important smiled the pandit what is important is that you are disturbed about something do you want to talk about it Shiva took a deep breath. Gut instinct told him that he could trust this man. There is this task that I supposedly have to do for my Luha. I know, though I would not dismiss the Nilkant's role as a task. He does much more than that. Pointing at Shiva's throat, the pandit continued, "Pieces of cotton cannot cover divine brilliance." Shiva looked up with a wry smile. Well, Meluha does seem like a wonderful society, and I want to do all I can to protect it from evil. Then what is the problem? The problem is that I find some grossly unfair practices in this nearly perfect society, and this is inconsistent with the ideals that Meluha aspires to. What practices are you referring to? asked the pandit. For example, the way the vikarma are treated. Why is it unfair? How can anyone be sure that these people committed sins in their previous birth and that their present sufferings are a result of that? It might be sure bad luck or a random act of nature. You are right, it could be. But do you think that the fate of the vikarma is about then personally is not it no it is not explained the pandit it is about the society as a whole the vikarma acceptance of their fate is integral to the stability of meluha shiva frowned what any successful society needs o oh, nilkant is flexibility with stability Why would you need flexibility? 
because every single person has different dreams and capabilities. The birth son of a warrior could have the talent to be a great businessman. Then society needs to be flexible enough to allow the son to change his vocation from his father's profession. Flexibility in a society allows change so that all its members have the space to discover their true selves and grow to their potential. And if every person in a society achieves his true potential, society as a whole also achieves its true potential. I agree. But what does this have to do with the Vikarma? I will come to the obvious question in a bit. Just bear with me, said the Pandit. If we believe that flexibility is key to a successful society, the Maika system is designed to achieve it in practice. No child knows what the professions of his birth parents are. They are independent to pursue what their natural talent inspires them to do. I agree. The Maika system is almost breathtakingly fair. A person can credit or blame only himself for what he does with his life. Nobody else. But this is about flexibility. What about stability? Stability allows a person the freedom of choice, my friend. People can pursue their dreams only when they are living in a society where survival is not a daily threat. In a society without security and stability, there are no intellectuals or businessmen or artists or geniuses. Man is constantly in fight or flight mode, nothing better than an animal. Where is the chance then to allow ideas to be nurtured or dreams to be pursued? That is the way all humans were before we formed societies. Civilization is fairly fragile. All it takes is a few decades of chaos for us to forget humanity and turn into animals. Our base natures can take over very fast. We can forget that we are sentient beings with laws and codes and ethics. I understand. The tribes in my homeland were no better than animals. They do not even want to live for a better life. Want to live a better life. They did not know a better life was possible. Nilkant. That is a curse of constant strife. It makes us forget the most beautiful part of being human. That is why society must remain stable so that we don't put each other in a situation of having to fight for survival. All right, but why would letting people achieve their potential cause instability? In fact, it should make people happier with their lives and hence society would become increasingly steady. True, but only partially. People are happy when they change their lives for better. But there are two situations in which change can lead to chaos. First, when people face a change by others, situations that they cannot understand. This scares them almost as much as the fear of death. When change happens too fast, they resist it. Yes, change forced by others is difficult to accept. And too rapid a change causes instability, that is, the bedrock of Lord Ram's way of life. There are laws which help a society change slowly and allow it to remain stable. At the same time, it allows its citizens the freedom to follow their dreams. He created an ideal balance of stability and flexibility. You mentioned a second situation. The second is when people cannot make the transition they want to improve their lives for reasons beyond their control. Say, there is an exceptional warrior who loses his hand-eye coordination due to a disease. He is still a fighter but not extraordinary anymore. The odds 
are that he will be frustrated about what he perceives as injustice meted out to him he is unlike he is likely to blame his doctor or even society at large many such discontent people many such discontented people can become a threat to society as a whole shiva frowned he did not like the logic but he also knew that one of the main reasons the prakritis had rejected the peace offer by his uncle years ago was because they are diseased and old chief was desperate to live up to his initial reputation of being an exceptional warrior who could have defeated the gunas the combined rage can lead to unrest even violence said the pandit lord ram sends that and that is why the concept of vikarma came into being if you make a person believe that his misfortune in this birth is due to his sins in his previous birth he will resign himself to his fate and not vent his fury on society at large but i disagree that ostracizing the vikarma can work it would lead to more suppressed anger but they are not ostracized their living is subsidized by the government they can still interact with family members they are allowed to gain personal excellence in their chosen fields wherever possible they can also fight to protect themselves what they can't do is ever be in a position to influence others and this system has worked for 1000 years do you know how common rebellion was in india before lord ram created his empire and most of the times the rebellions were not led by far sighted men who thought they would create a better way of life for the common man they were led by men discontented with their lot in life people very much like the vikarma and these rebellions usually caused chaos and decades when by before order was restored so are you saying that anyone who is frustrated with life should simply design himself to being a, a vikarma said shiva why for the larger good of society shiva was aghast he could not believe what he was hearing he deeply disliked the arguments being presented to him i am sorry but i think this system is completely unfair i have heard that almost 120th of the people in meluha are vikarma are you going to keep so many people as outcasts forever this system needs to change you can change it you are the nilakant but remember no system is absolutely perfect in lord ram's time a lady called mandhara triggered a series of events which led to the loss of millions of lives she had suffered terribly due to her physical deformities and then fate put her in a position of influence over a powerful queen and thus over the entire kingdom therefore the karma of one mal- maladjusted victim of fate led to the mass destruction that followed would it not have been better for everybody if this person had been declared a vikarma there are no easy answers having said that maybe you are right maybe there are so many vikarma now that it can lead to a tipping point tumble society in chaos do i have the solution to this problem no maybe could find it Shiva turned his face away. He believed in his heart that the vikarma system was unfair. Are you concerned about all the vikarma o nilkant as the pandit or just one in particular? What is the lord doing in there? as Nandi. He is taking too long. I don't know, said Veerbhadra. 
All I know is that if Shiva says he needs to do something, I accept it. Why do you call the Lord by his name? Because that is his name. Nandi smiled at the simple answer and turned to look at the temple. Tell me, Captain, said Veerabhadra. Coming close to Nandi, is Kritika spoken for? Spoken for? I mean, continued Veerabhadra. Is she off limits? You know what I mean, said Veerabhadra, turning beet red. She is a widow, said Nandi. Her husband died 15 years back. Oh, that's terrible. Yes, it is, said Nandi as he smiled at Veerabhadra. But to answer your question, she is not spoken for her right now. My lady, may I say something? asked Kritika. Sati turned from the guest room window to look at Kritika with a surprised frown. Have I ever stopped you from speaking your mind? A true Surya Vanshi always speaks her mind. Well, said Kritika, sometimes it may not be that harmful to lose control of yourself. Sati frowned even more. Kritika spoke quickly before her courage deserted her. Forget about him being the Nilkant, my lady. Just as a man, I think he is the finest I have seen. He is intelligent and brave, funny and kind, and worships the ground you walk on. Is that really so bad? Sati glared at Kritika. She did not know if she was more upset at Kritika for what she was saying or at herself for having feelings which were apparently so evident. Kritika continued, Maybe, just maybe. Breaking the rules can lead to happiness. I am a Suryavanshi, said Sati, her voice dropping. Rules are all that I live by. What have I got to do with happiness? Don't ever dare to speak to me about this again. Yes, there is this particular Vikarma, admitted Shiva, but that is not why I think the Vikarma law is unfair. I know that, said the Pandit, but I also know that what troubles you right now is your relationship with that one in particular. You don't want her to think that you would change the law however justified just to get her, because if Sati believes that, she will never come to you. How do you know her name? asked Shiva flabbergasted. We know many things, my friend. My entire life is meaningless without her. I know, smiled the Pandit. Perhaps I can help you. Shiva frowned. This was unexpected. You want her to reciprocate your love? But how can she when you don't even understand her? I think I understand her. I love her. Yes, you do love her, but you don't understand her. You don't know what she wants. Shiva kept quiet. He knew the Pandit was right. He was thoroughly confused about Sati. You can hazard a guess towards what she wants, continued the Pandit, with the help of the theory of transactions. What? asked Flamox to Shiva. It makes up the fabric of society. Excuse me, but what does this have to do with Sati? Indulge me. For a little while, Nilkant said the Pandit, You know the cloth that you wear is created when cotton threads are woven together, right? Yes, answered Shiva. Similarly, transactions are threads that when woven together make up a society, its culture, or in the case of a person, weaves together their character. Shiva nodded. If you want to know the strength of a cloth, you inspect the quality of its weave. If you want to understand a person's character, look closely at their interpersonal behavior or their transactions. All right, said Shiva, slowly absorbing the pundit's word. But transactions are... I'll explain, interrupted the pundit. Transactions are interactions between two individuals. 
It could be trading goods like a Shudra farmer offering grain for money from a Vaishya. But it could also be beyond material concerns like a Kshatriya offering protection to a society in return for power. Shiva nodded in agreement. Transactions are about give and take. Exactly. So going by this logic, if you want something from someone, you have to give that person something they want. So what do you think she wants? Asked Shiva. Try and understand Sati's transactions. What do you think she wants? I don't know. She is very confusing. No, she is not. There is a pattern. Think. She is probably the most eminent Vikarma in the history. She has the power to rebel if she wants to. She certainly has a spread since she never backs off from a fight. But she does not rebel against the Vikarma law. Neither does she fade into the background like most Vikarmas and live her life in anonymity. She follows the commandments and yet she does not whine and complain to others. However, unfairly life treats her, she conducts herself with dignity. Why? Because she is a righteous person. That she is, no doubt. But that is not the reason. Remember, in a transaction, you give something because you want something in return. She is accepting an unfair law without trying to make anyone feel guilty about it. And most importantly, she continues to use her talents to contribute to the good of society whenever she can. What do you think a person who is giving all this in her transaction with society wants in return? Respect, answered Shiva. Exactly, beamed the Pandit. And what do you think you do when you try to protect such a person? Disrespect her. Absolutely. I know it comes naturally to you to want to protect any good person who appears in need. But control that feeling in relation to Sati. Respect her and she will feel irresistibly drawn towards you. She gets many things from the people who love her. What she does not get is what she craves the most. Respect. She will look at the Pandit with a grateful smile. He had found his answer, respect. After two weeks, the Nilkan's convoy reached the city of Karachapa. At the confluence of the Indus into the Western Sea, it was a glittering city which had long grown beyond the one platform it was built on. The Dvithya, or second platform, had been erected 50 years ago on an even grander scale than the first. The Dvitiya platform was where the Karachapa elite lived. The governor, a diminutive Vaishya called Juleshwar, had heard of and followed the new tradition of receiving the Nilkanth outside the city. Karachapa, with its 100,000 citizens, was at its heart a frontier trading city. Therefore, it was an act of foresight by Lord Brahmanayak, Emperor Daksha's father, to have appointed a Vaishya as its governor over a hundred years ago. Juleshwar had ruled the city extraordinarily well, gilding its fate in gold and was considered its wisest and most efficient governor ever. Karachapa had long overtaken Lothal on the eastern part of the empire to become Meluha's premier city of commerce, while foreigners such as Mesopotamians and Egyptians were allowed into this liberal city. They were not allowed to travel further into Meluha without express royal permission. Juleshwar escorted the Nilkanth on an excursion to the Western Sea on his very first day in Karachapa. Shiva had never seen the sea and was fascinated by the near infinite expanse of water. 
He spent many hours at the port where Julius Bach proudly expounded on the various types of ships and vessels manufactured at the shipyard attached to the Karachapa port. Brahaspati accompanied them to the port to check on the imports due for him from the Mesopotamian merchants. At the evening state dinner organized for Shiva, Juleshwar proudly announced that a jagna, a ceremonial fire sacrifice, was being organized the next day in honor of the Nilkanth. Under the auspices of Lord Varun and the legendary Ashwini Kumar twins. The Ashwini Kumar twins were celebrated ancient seafarers who had navigated ocean routes from Meluha to Mesopotamia and beyond. Their maps, guidance, and stories were a source of inspiration and learning for this city of seamen. After dinner, Shiva visited the chambers where Sati and Kritika were housed. I was wondering, said Shiva, still careful with Sati, since she had gone back to being formal with him. Will you be coming to the Yagna tomorrow? I am very sorry, Lord Nilkant, said Sati courteously, but it may not be possible for me to attend the ceremony. I am not allowed to attend such Yagnas. She was about to say that nobody would question her since she would be attending with the Nilkant. But he thought better of it. Perhaps we could have a dance practice tomorrow. I cannot remember the last time we had a dance session. That would be nice. I have not had the benefit of your instruction in a long time, said Sati. Shiva nodded unhappily at Sati. The freeze in their relationship tormented him. Bidding goodbye, he turned to leave. Kritika glanced at Sati, shaking her head imperceptibly. Om Namah Shivaya. Thank you friends. Please do subscribe to our channel. Give us a thumbs up if you like this audiobook. Thank you and do share with your friends.